Are you here for chickens? Everybody here for chickens? Nobody here for goats or bees or urban sheep? I hope everybody's here for to talk about backyard chickens because this is the chicken lady <laughs> from Oak Park, Illinois, Jennifer Murtoff. I'd like to thank her for coming. Thank the Harbor Market for making this space and the Rhodey um, Theater people for making this space available and Kenosha News for participating in this. Thank you for coming. I'm going to just turn it over to Jennifer, the, so. the urban chicken consultant of Oak Park, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for coming and uh, to Jeff and to Ray and especially Steve for inviting me here. Um, I'm always very happy when I get a captive audience to talk to about chickens because chickens are one of my passions in life. So y'all are here to hear about my passion. Um, so you're already you are here to hear about chickens and why people are raising them in urban areas. So uh, we're going to kind of talk about the reasons why people are doing this. I'm sure you have some ideas already. Um, before we move into that, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania. My grandfather was a farmer. And um, when I was 10, um, I got my first chickens. So I got four leghorn chicks. And then that quickly blossomed into a flock that included uh, peacocks and um, golden pheasants, quail, geese, turkeys, ducks. I hand raised a couple baby pigeons. So this has been like a lifelong endeavor for me. When I moved to, when I went to college, obviously, I couldn't keep my chickens, so I got rid of the whole flock. And then um, when I graduated from graduate school, I got an Alexandrine parakeet. Through the whole process of years of caring for chickens myself, because my dad said, we're not taking chickens to the vet, um, I learned to address medical issues, urgent care issues, and then sometimes I just couldn't do anything for them, and my dad took care of them um, when they were injured or sick. So um, then in taking the Alexandrian parakeet to the avian vet, I began to learn a lot about avian medicine and psychology, a lot more than I had taught myself. And so this has given me this sort of wealth of psychological and medical and, and animal husbandry knowledge about chickens. And so when I found out that there was this trend towards urban agriculture, um, I walked into my accountant's office um, in 2007, and he looked at my chicken purse, and he said, you have a chicken purse? And I said, yeah. So I had chickens when I was a kid. He said, well, I want to raise chickens. And I said, but you live in the Austin neighborhood of Chicago. How are you going to have chickens? He said, oh, people are doing this all over the city. So we um, talked about how to place the coop. We talked about raising chicks. And then he looked at me and he said, well, you could be an urban chicken consultant. And I thought, hmm, I like that. I like the sound of that. So I mocked up business cards on Vistaprint. And you'll find some of those on the table up here in front. And um, in 2009, I started a blog, which is urbanchickenconsultant.wordpress.com. You can also find it by Googling home to roost urban chickens. Um, and so it just kind of took off from there. So I've been helping people all over the Chicagoland area raise chickens. Um, I've been kind of assisting with emergency situations. I'm not a veterinarian. I don't pretend to be one. But if you're interested in somebody who can give you an idea of sort of a middle ground between John Doe chicken owner who doesn't know much about chickens and behavior and avian medicine and an avian veterinarian, I kind of fill that space. So I've had some people call me saying, my chicken's having seizures. And so I talk to them a little bit more and I figure out, okay, well, the chicken's just taking a dust bath. Or I think my chicken is sick. She's been in the nest for three days. And so I say, well, hold the phone up to the chicken. Based on the sounds she's making, I can say, your hen is broody. She's not sick. She's just trying to hatch eggs. Um, and then if there's seriously something that I can't do anything about, then I'll say, call one of these certified avian vets in the Chicagoland area, and they can take care of your bird for you. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, I've been doing this now since 2008, and um, it's, it's really a joy for me. I really enjoy it. So we're going to talk about the reasons why people from Denver to Seattle, from Chicago to Wisconsin, from you know, all over the United States are raising chickens. I recently consulted to the Baltimore Office of Sustainability. They wanted a chicken keeping um, ordinance for their city and best practices guidelines. So I provided them with that. So, um, so we're going to listen to a video. This is Stephanie Weaver. She lives on the south side of Chicago, and I will let her introduce herself and tell you a little bit about her chickens. Hi, I'm Stephanie Weaver, and this is my chicken, Chipmunk. Um, so I have three Easter egg chickens, uh, and we live in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Chicago. I've kept chickens for about a year and a half. 
Um, I like raising them because they're great pets and easy to take care of, and they lay really good eggs. Okay, so whoops. What were some of the things you heard her mention? Just shout them out. Reasons why she's keeping chickens? Good eggs. Good eggs. Pets. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at some of those things, those two things in particular, and then we're going to look at a bunch of other things in addition to those two. So the first thing that Stephanie mentioned was the eggs. Now you see you've got two eggs in the nest here. One's a little dirty. The, <laughs> the, uh, the chicken owner hadn't collected the egg soon enough, so it got poop on it. But this is, this is the, the reality of having chickens. You can go out in your, in your backyard and collect breakfast. Um, so undisputed freshness from the backyard is one of the reasons why people are raising chickens. I think the downturn in the economy, people just want to feel secure about their food sources. Um, the coop on the left is one of my clients in Oak Park, and then the coop down at the bottom is another client in Oak Park. Um, the one on the left is a sort of A-frame coop that can be placed over um, raised beds, and the one on the right is just a small coop um, with a flip top open opening for it. So um, let's talk a little bit about eggs. Um, what, what is the best kind of egg you can buy? Can anybody tell me, what, what do you think is the best kind of egg? Fresh. Fresh, OK. Any other ideas? Organic. Organic, OK. What about color? Brown. Brown, OK. We have somebody said it doesn't matter. Any other, any other suggestions? Um, the color? Of the eggs, as you can see, these eggs are all different colors. We have some sort of the bluish green cast eggs that come from the Araucanas or Americanas, also known as Easter eggers. We've got the dark brown eggs. We've got some sort of buff colored eggs. The color of the eggshell, and then down here we have some lovely chocolate brown eggs. The color of the eggshell is largely determined by the breed of the bird. The, um, the breed determines the color of the shell. There's not any difference in nutritional value between a brown egg versus a white egg or a green egg versus a chocolate brown egg. And we'll talk a little, about, little bit about that here in a couple minutes. Um, different chickens lay different colored eggs. So your Araucanas or Americanas, as I said, will lay the blue-green eggs. The eggs on the bottom there on the right-hand side are laid by a breed called a Maran, and those are from France. And these are just becoming popular in the United States. Um, the hen's body, the breed, it, it, the hen's body will put the pigment on the shell. So there's no, um, really doesn't depend on um, what she's eaten or her nutritional, um, her nutritional health. Um, it, it's the color, or the color of the egg is determined by the breed of the chicken. And then you get some smaller eggs. Um, there's a huge egg at, at the top, which is probably a double yolk. And then immediately below it is a very small egg, which could be either a bantam egg or a pullet egg. A pullet is a hen who's just beginning to lay eggs. She's a younger hen. Sometimes they have a few practice eggs, which turn out to be kind of funky looking. And um, a bantam is a small chicken. There's um, standard size fowl, and then there's, there's a bantam fowl. And the bantam fowl will naturally lay um, smaller eggs. The white eggs that you see in the supermarket are laid by white leghorns. It's a breed that was developed in Italy. And all of these other eggs, most of the other chicken eggs you see are going to be this brown or tan color. Um, so um, the difference in content of what's inside the egg is in the diet. And uh, this is an experiment, an egg experiment, that I did a couple, I think it was a couple months ago. Um, I broke open a store-bought egg, and I broke open a backyard egg. Um, the color is not terribly clear here, but can you guess which one is the backyard egg? The one on the right, the one on the right. And the difference here is the backyard egg will be much deeper in color because the hen is eating more plant protein or plant materials that contain xanthophils and other um, natural substances that color the yolk of the egg. So I cooked these two side by side. Oh, and then if you also know, there's a little tiny blood spot in the backyard egg, which can be eaten. It won't hurt you. It's kind of on the left side um, down on the, on the bottom side of the yolk. So I cooked these two eggs side by side, decided to do a taste test. And um, I cut them open. Now here, the backyard egg is on the left-hand side. The uh, battery cage egg is on the right. Um, the, the egg on the left, the backyard egg, the yolk was much more viscous. It was thicker, and it also had a more rich taste to it. So, and there's a couple reasons for that. Oh, and the other thing was when you break the backyard eggs open, they generally have a much thicker shell. The hen's getting more calcium. She's getting properly nourished, and um, she's a very healthy bird. 
Also, when you cook the egg in the pan, the egg will have what's called muscle, a little more muscle tone. The yolk will sit higher in the pan for the backyard egg. Now, as, as the eggs get older, they'll lose some of that muscle tone. But generally, the backyard eggs will sit up a little. The, the yolk will be more perky in the pan. So this was my little taste test experiment. Um, definitely more robust flavor and um, definitely a difference in backyard eggs versus the, um, the uh, store-bought eggs. So the second reason people are raising chickens is health risks. Um, you heard about the, the um, salmonella scare in Indiana a couple years ago. Eggs came out of um, the backyard or the battery, the battery cage farms in Indiana and they were tainted with salmonella. The reason why that happens, and we'll see a picture of this later, is the hens are packed into tiny little spaces. They might, might put eight in a space that's this big. They don't have enough room to move. They, don't, they can't do natural behaviors and they, the situation is very stressful for them. So that puts them at risk for disease. Um, so if you have hens in your backyard who are freely scratching around, who are living together in a large space that's sufficient for their size, you're gonna have happier birds and they're going to be also healthier birds. Um, also, if there is, um, there is a chance of there being salmonella on the birds, you should always handle, you should always uh, wash your hands after handling the birds. There's the same risk as with turtles or snakes or other reptiles. Um, uh, there is a slight risk of you contracting salmonella from the chickens. Always wash your hands afterwards. But chances are you may be sort of immune, have developed some immunity to that strain of salmonella because your body will already, already be familiar with it. So what about the eggs themselves? Um, we talked a little bit about nutritional value. Um, do you think that there's a difference in nutrition between backyard eggs and battery cage eggs? The answer is yes. There was a study done in Mother Earth News um, in 2007 and 2008, and it was determined that the backyard eggs have a third less cholesterol, a quarter less saturated fat, two times more omega-3s, three times more vitamin E, two-thirds more vitamin A, four to six times more vitamin D, and seven times more beta-carotene than the eggs you get in the store. And I will say about the store eggs, the cartons may be labeled organic, they might be labeled um, free range, they might be labeled um, um, any, other, any other nutritional labels. The labels really don't mean a whole lot. In many cases, the birds are still kept in a very large area with large numbers of other birds. Um, the USDA doesn't have a whole lot of tooth to enforce those laws. There's a post on my blog, it's called um, What's in a Name? Egg Carton Labels and it talks about all of the egg carton labels that you see in the store. The best kind of eggs you can buy outside of backyard eggs, they're animal welfare approved eggs. So if you want really good eggs from a really good certified source, that's the way to go. So this study in Mother Earth News took a look at the battery cage eggs versus the backyard eggs, found all these great benefits to um, the backyard eggs. And the reason for that is better nutrition. If a hen is out tooling around, she's on grass, she's eating bugs, she's eating worms, she's eating grubs, she's able to do natural behaviors like foraging, dust bathing, um, just chicken things, preening herself, she's gonna be a happier bird, she's gonna be better nourished, and her eggs will therefore be better as well. One of the other reasons people are raising chickens, and this is me at age 10 with my favorite rooster hot stuff, um, you can see the massive 1980s glasses there. Um, hot stuff, oh my goodness, he was, he was a stinker. He was my bird and he would, he would flog anybody else who came in his vicinity, but he wouldn't touch me. Um, so that's hot stuff, he holds a special place in my heart. Um, so when I was a kid, you know, I, I took on the responsibility of having all these chickens and then ultimately this, this whole menagerie of different fowl. Um, one of the things that taught me as a child was responsibility in caring for another living being. So in the morning, I would get up. Before I had my breakfast, I would take, you know, five-gallon buckets of water and haul them out. We had a three, three-and-a-half, four-acre lot. I would haul them out and make sure that my chickens had food and water. Then I'd come in, have breakfast, and go to school. And then when I came home from school, the next thing for me to do was immediately feed the chickens, water the chickens before I had my snack, before I did my homework. That was the order of operations. Their needs came first because they were dependent on me. So that was one of the things that, that keeping chickens impressed on me as a kid. Um, 
So I mentioned that uh, my grandfather had the uh, rule of never naming the steers, never naming the hogs, and never naming the chickens. He was a wise man. Um, my chickens, however, had names because they were pets. So as you think about chickens, ask yourself the question, is this a pet or is this a, uh, is this a food source? And many of you have indicated that you'd be interested in having chickens for both meat and eggs, as opposed to just companion animals. Um, the other things I learned from keeping chickens were um, I would hatch out chicks, and then I would take them to stock market. And it wasn't the New York stock market. It was live stock market. Um, and uh, the, I would sell my chickens and get a little bit of money for them. And then I would save that money back for a project I wanted um, or, or something of that nature. Sometimes I would use that money to buy new chickens. So I was learning basic money management skills through this whole endeavor. Um, I would also hatch and sell the chicks to people. I'd put up a sign that said live chicks for sale. And people would stop by our little country house and they would, they would purchase chicks around Easter time. Um, then um, I would also learn to pick the healthy animals. Uh, if I went to livestock market to purchase, chi to purchase chickens to add to my flock, my grandfather and I would look through the, the boxes available and he'd say, well, I think this one is sick. You know, take a look at this. Make sure that you get the healthy ones. He was very clear about um, you know, getting good animals uh, to add to my stock. So how many of you think this was a money-making endeavor for me? How many of you think it's a money-making endeavor for my parents? <laughs> my, father, my father and mother subsidized uh, a large portion of my chicken habit. My dad said, we're not going to get a horse. I wanted a horse. And he said, we're not getting a horse. The only thing they do is eat. Well, I'm not sure if he made out so much with the chickens, but they were, it was a good educational experience for me. And then also learning about where food comes from. I knew that lesson already because my grandfather and grandmother were farmers. Um, but just seeing that played out and how the life cycle works, all, all great educational experiences. So this is Elsa, and she is one of my little chicken recruits. Um, Elsa and her family live in Oak Park, and these are the two chicks that she got uh, three years ago now. And um, she really enjoys um, her chickens, and one of the important things for her and her family is learning the, to answer the question, where, does, where do eggs come from? Many people think, oh, you just go to the store, especially in Chicago where everything is commercialized. You go to the store, you get a dozen eggs, and that's where eggs come from. But nope, they come from these little birds. So Elsa has been enjoying caring for her chickens. I have a little quick video of her, her and I. She really enjoys collecting the eggs, and her brother is learning about um, gr growing chickens, too. So it's been fun watching these kids learn a lot from me about chickens and sort of passing on my love of chickens to them. So are there, is there anybody here who can go out in the backyard and get breakfast? Any of you have any, um, any sort of farm animals, livestock? I've got one person here who's got chickens. I believe I've got somebody else back here, too. Anybody else have sort of livestock animals at home? No? OK. So another one of the reasons why people are getting chickens is because of self-sufficiency. Economic downturn, we want to be sure that we've got some source of food. It's, it's really helpful to have a bird in the backyard who can give you breakfast. And you can also go out with a chopping block and take care of it if you choose. Um, so chickens provide meat, eggs, and they also provide fertilizer. Um, this is my friend John Perryman, who has a chicken coop in Chicago. And you can see he's got the raised bed gardens um, there in front of his chicken coop. Um, John is an urban homesteader, and he started off with the raised bed gardens. And um, the next step in this whole process is getting chickens. The chickens provide a useful source of fertilizer to fertilize those raised beds. So they also do uh, bio-recycling. So as you're watching these chickens in the video clip, you'll notice them scratching around the grass they're in the dirt. They're looking for bugs. They're moving all this leaf litter around. They act as natural composters. Um, as they're looking for things to eat, um, they're moving things around. They're finding bugs. They're finding worms, working as bio-recyclers. So some people use their chickens to turn their compost piles in the city. And um, they also loosen the soil to make it easier for planting. And um, this, this whole process just makes this really rich, uh, dark soil. We're going to do a little bit of chemistry here as we talk about poop. So do any of you currently use, do any of you do gardening, add um, manure to your gardens? OK, we've got some people who do that. 
So there's a difference between um, the hot compost and the regular compost. Chicken poop is hot compost. It will burn your plants if you put it directly on the, um, on the plants. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about that and the chemical reason behind it. So plants need nitrogen to make certain amino acids. Nitrogen acts as a food for plants. And poop, chicken poop, has ammonium, which is NH4. Um, and this NH4 as a chemical component compound cannot be used by plants. So it has to be broken down and undergo what's called nitrogen fixation. And um, when, when nitrogen becomes fixed, nitrogen is usually um, an inert noble gas. It's uh, two nitrogens bonded together. They can't break apart, and they don't bond to anything else. So in this whole chemical process, the plants need um, nitrogen in the form of nitrates, NO3. So the nitrogen has to be fixed. What happens is this is the chemical equation that, that the poop will break down into. So the first step is ammonium, which comes out of the back end of the chicken as that. It bonds, it breaks down with the aid of oxygen into nitrites. Now, if you guys know anything about farming or fertilizing, nitrites are what burn your plants and burn your crops. So you don't want to have those on your plants. So this whole equation goes through Another step, you see the nitrites are now the, uh, one of the um, inputs of the equation. You add oxygen, and then that forms nitrates, which are actually helpful for your plants. So this whole compost, composting pro process with chicken poop, it's a six to, eight, six to nine month process, depending on um, how quick your composting works. But eventually, it'll break down into something that's useful for your plants. The caveat is, the takeaway is, Chicken poop is great, but you need to let it sit in your composter for a while for this chemical reason. Any questions about that? Yes? I have developed a further step uh, mm -hmm. in, in my poop as I am fortunate to get scraps from restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, kitchen scraps. That's what I mostly feed my chickens. Mm -hmm. And I have these piles of stuff that in the summer gets to smell it and my neighbors don't like that too much. So my next step is moving that into a vermiculture box. Okay. So it goes to an area where I can keep all this smelly stuff in clothes mm -hmm. and red beetles go through it. Yep. Yep. Does that accelerate the process? What do you talk about? The red wigglers, I actually have a worm bin in my kitchen. And the, the chicken, what we're, what we're doing here is the chicken poop is the, is the issue. The chicken poop is what contains the ammonium and has that, the hot compost in it. And that would be mixed to the vegetables, I'm guessing, because obviously the chickens poop with where they eat. They yeah. They don't care too much about that. If you mix the chicken poop with the red wigglers, you'll kill the red wigglers because of that, the nitrites will burn their skin. Okay. So the ammonia will be, will be deadly to the red wigglers. I actually, I, I had taken quail droppings. I have, I have two button quail at home, and I had taken quail droppings and put them in my worm bin, ended up killing my worms. So well, you can either... The, the poop is going to be in the coop. Yeah. If, if, I, if I move that, that product mm -hmm. somewhere else and not mixed with the, with the stuff that the chickens have been eating, mm -hmm. Then, then I'm fine? The, the key is to keep the chicken poop and the worms separate. So if you're going to do vegetable composting, if you want your chickens to dig around in the heap, you can put a pile there for the chickens. If you want to put it directly into your, your vermicomposting bin, then um, just the, the key is keep the chicken poop and the worms separate. Yep. Good question. Excellent. All right, so now we've talked about poop. That's one P. We have a second P, and that's personality. One other reason why people raise chickens is because they make great, great pets. They're very personable. Um, they're very sweet. And so when I, when I got my four leghorn chicks, um, I started to discover little personalities. There was Baby, who was the really sweet hen. There was Hot Stuff, the big bad rooster, who was definitely the alpha male. There was Little Boy, who was Hot Stuff's subservient sidekick. And then there was Jitterbug, who was this typically jittery leghorn hen. And, um, so through the years I've, in working with chickens, I've found that they do have personalities. And you'll end up with one who's kind of a clown. Um, this little lady in the upper left, her name is Lady Gaga. She stayed with me um, until I found her a home with a vet tech. She had a broken leg. And she, her favorite thing in the world to do, I would let her tool around the kitchen sometimes when I, was, uh, when I was cooking. She loved to come sit on my shoes. She would just hang out on my shoes while I was at the, at the sink doing dishes. Um, 
She also really enjoyed sweet corn. I have a couple pictures of her eating sweet corn. Um, this uh, sweet rooster on the right, um, he was found in Chicago. Um, he was a very docile, very sweet boy. Um, the people who found him were terrified of picking him up, but he was, he was great. Down in the lower left is one of my show chickens. Her name was Jo. And um, she could, you could do anything with that bird. Very docile, very tame. You can see I've got a lot of kids there around her handling her. And then in the lower right, the white hen's name is Sushi. And Sushi acted as the leader of her flock. She uh, taught everybody, she was kind of a teacher bird. She taught everybody, all the other birds in the flock, how to behave, what to do, where to go. Very good chicken. So as you come to know your chickens, you'll realize that you've got the singer, you've got the clown, you've got the sociopath, you've got a leader, you've got a cornball. And then, um, yeah, you'll find all of these just, just wonderful personalities in your birds, which leads then to the question of, oh my goodness, how can I eat this bird if it has a personality? Um, so that's something to think about as you, as you ponder the idea of getting chickens. You know, what do you do when you find out that your favorite chicken you know, really enjoys blueberries? Does that, does that change your idea of, of what chickens are for? Are they domesticated for food purposes, or, um, or is this going to be a companion animal? So let's see here. This is, um, this is a little hen that belonged to a client of mine. She's a little game bantam hen, a very, very sweet bird. Her name was Tammy. So chickens will become part of the family is ultimately the, the lesson learned here. So chickens have personalities. I think they have feelings, um, maybe not necessarily in the same way that we do. So what does this mean for um, battery cage chickens that are raised in operations like this? This is where 95% of the eggs in North America come from. A large majority of them look like this. This is the 79 cent dozen of eggs you get in the supermarket. They come from hens that have um, basically been tortured their entire life. Um, cramped conditions. They force the birds to molt, which molting, um, when chickens molt, they lose their feathers. And during that period, they're putting all their energies into replenishing their feathers and not into laying eggs. So when a hen is undergoing a molt, she'll stop laying eggs. Because of um, industrial agriculture, it's important to continue producing. Um, the farmers will force the hens to molt. They'll drop their feathers very quickly. Um, and the, the way they do that is by withholding food and water for a day or two. So it's very stressful on the birds. They end up molting, and then they go back in to lay right away. Um, some of the other things they live with are rough handling. Sometimes a bird will get um, you know, a foot or a wing caught in the cage, and she won't be able to get out and reach the food, and they starve to death. So one of the reasons that people are raising chickens um, in this country is because of animal welfare issues. It's much better, better karma, I guess, to have battery, um, to have backyard chickens than battery cage eggs. Um, um, so these are some quotes about animal welfare from Anna Sewell, Immanuel Kant, and Mahatma Gandhi. So as you're thinking about getting backyard chickens, consider these happy hens running around John's yard in Chicago versus the hens that we saw um, in the pictures. And I think it's really important um, to look at our agricultural processes in the United States and um, you know, consider, consider how our food sources are being raised. So in addition to that, um, backyard chickens are also sort of a return to the land. It's a more simpler lifestyle. It's, um, you, do any of you have relatives who raise chickens, grandmothers, great aunts, great uncles? So trying to get back to those agrarian roots. A lot of people just want to want something simpler, something that reminds them of a connection to the land. Um, my grandparents raised chickens. Their grandparents raised chickens. This was just something that you did in this country for years. So I think it's important to try to return to that. And um, that's another one of those reasons that uh, people are, are doing this again. Um, there's also the idea of ecological synergy. And my grandparents' farm, it was sort of a microbiome. Everything had its purpose. You know, the, the hogs would eat the slop from the kitchen, and the chickens would produce eggs. The chickens, in turn, would provide meat. Um, the uh, chickens would also get scraps from the kitchen. The dog got the scraps that the hogs and the chickens didn't get. It was this very um, connected um, sort of microbiome. Everything had its purpose. And if, you, if you've, how many of you have read Michael Pollan, Wendell Berry, any of the um, sort of agrarian philosophers? Okay. So as we're looking at, you know, large feedlot operations and large manure ponds and these huge smelly chicken houses, 
how can we return to something that is more of an ecologically synergistic um, method of raising our food? Um, so this quote here, when humans support anim animals to do what they're designed to do, herbivores eating grass, chickens eating bugs, pigs rooting in open fields, farm animals basically living healthy, protected lives on open pasture, it appears that this may very well have a more positive ecological impact than eliminating animal products from the diet. Um, have you heard of Joel Salatin, the grass farmer in Virginia? Joel's basic philosophy is he calls himself a grass farmer. He raises other animals for meat, but ultimately, the health of his farm is dependent on the health of his grass. So he'll, he'll um, let fields lie fallow, the grass will grow up. He'll send in the chicken, or he'll send in the uh, cows or send in other animals to eat the grass, move those larger animals, the larger herbivores, to another pasture. He'll send the chickens in then to clean up after um, the cows. So the chickens will um, mix the cow pats into the pasture, refertilizing the pasture. In turn, they'll get any biomass, any um, worms or fly maggots or, or things that are residing in the cow pats. They'll take them out, acts as a source, for the ch source of food for the chickens. And then he keeps moving these animals around from pasture to pasture. And it's a very healthy, synergistic, ecologically sound way of farming. So that's kind of what we're talking about here, a simplification of the food system, less waste, um, less production of methane, less production of um, uh, potentially uh, poisonous um, agricultural runoff products like the manure, um, things of that nature. And also the, the principle of nothing is wasted. Grandparents had a no waste principle. They grew up during the depression. So it was very important for them not to waste anything. And we waste a lot in this country. Um, so that is one of the other things. Then there's other ways that agribusinesses are affecting the, the bird population, the animal population, and also the plant population in this country. We um, rely primarily on these three birds, these three breeds of birds for our chicken products. The one in the upper left is a broiler chicken, and these are the chickens that you'll find at the supermarket. Um, at, they are hatched. They're sent to a facility where they're raised and fed. Their bodies convert feed to meat at a very high rate of speed. So eventually, um, at six to eight weeks of age, they're shipped to the market where they're slaughtered. So the birds you buy in the store are only six to eight weeks old. They've been bred um, to produce, Americans like white meat, right? Anybody here like brown meat? Got a couple? OK. Americans like white meat. So the breast is the most important part of the chicken for our nation as a whole. So these broiler chickens are developed to have very heavy breasts. There's lots of breast meat there. As a result, the chickens go down on their legs. They can't stand anymore because their bodies get so heavy. Um, they also will develop um, problems of organ failure because they are, they're, they're entirely too heavy. Their bodies can't support the weight. Um, this particular chicken was found roaming the streets of Chicago. It had a broken wing. It had lesions under both wings. And then um, one of the people who took it, she took it to the vet and found out that it had a system-wide infection. So this is what we're ending up putting on the table. The white hen in the center is a white leghorn. She's an Italian breed from, from uh, Italy. I, I, the, what region of Italy do you know? I, have, I learned today it's an Italian bird. I didn't know. OK, OK. Um, the white leghorn is the primary layer of white eggs in our supermarkets. And then um, the hen below was rescued. Um, she is an Isa brown, which is a cross between a, either a Rhode Island red and a white leghorn, or a Rhode Island red and a white, uh, a white rock. She, um, these birds are the ones that lay the brown eggs in the supermarket. And take a look at her beak. What do you notice about the beak? It's short. When the chicks are raised, when, the, when birds are raised for egg production, massive egg production, they're under a lot of stress and they will pick at each other. So in order to combat that, each chick, when it's hatched, the beak is burnt off with a wire, with a hot wire. So she's had her beak burnt off almost to the point of this, this bird would not be able to eat naturally. I did, there was a bird who um, was brought into my vet's office and she had been de-beaked. And her, her top beak was so much shorter than her bottom beak, she wasn't able to eat. She was starving to death. So these are the three birds that we use primarily for um, meat and eggs in the United States. 
So can anybody name any other breeds of chickens? Besides the white leghorn, the Isa brown, and the Cornish rock. Bard rock, Bard rock good, okay. Rhode Island. Rhode Island red, great, thank you. Any others? I'm sorry? Bantams, Bantams okay, yep. <coughs> there are so many different breeds of chickens out there. Um, the top one is a silky. This is an ornamental breed. Marco Polo described these birds when he was in China. Great genetic diversity among chickens. We are losing some of these what are called heritage breeds, just the same as we're losing a lot of our um, seed crops. Um, the heritage varieties are being lost to varieties that can be transported more easily and still retain their flavor. So this is a silky in the upper left, Chinese breed. It has feathers that look like hair. Um, they're, just, they're great birds. They're ornamental. They're a lot of fun. Um, the one on the right is a bearded Belgian ducal, middle of fleur variety. The one at the bottom is the bard rock. And, um, so as these varieties are being lost or minimized, um, we're losing the genetic diversity of our chicken pool, um, threatening, as with crops, also threatening the, um, if something were to happen to, if some particular strain of virus were to hit white leghorns, we may lose um, a number of white leghorns if they don't have a gene that protects them from that. And um, finally, I just want to treat you to a little video. This was made by one of my clients in Oak Park. Her name's Jennifer Rossi. And this just kind of shares the fun and family experience it is to have chickens. Second line with an umbrella in your hand. 